Hi, thanks for tuning in today to Front Porch Conversations. Here Today we're here at the Harmony Center and our guest is Pastor Jack Jones. Jack, you don't probably need a lot of introduction to many people, at the, most people at the village, but I'm so glad you're here today so you can um, tell us about Jack and your family and your life and, and all in 30 minutes. All in 30 minutes. Why don't we start where you were born? I was born at a very young age in <laughs> Panama City, Florida. I, uh, I lived there until after high school. I went to college and discovered New England. Then shortly after that, I discovered uh, New Zealand and then Japan. And along during those times, I used to say, I've already served my term in North Florida. I don't have to go back. <laughs> but here I am, and it's good. Sometimes if, if we tell God what we don't want, he laughs mm -hmm. and says, nah, I'll mm -hmm. take care of it, right? I think so. <laughs> um, Jack, uh, tell us a little bit about growing up in Panama City. Well, we had salt water uh, in the bays and in the Gulf, and that was a, a big source of all of our recreation. Uh, I remember one time when I was very young, maybe about three, we were living in one end of a duplex house and we had a walk that went out from our door out to the walk by the road and then over to the other one. So I had this nice little road there to run my truck along. Somewhere I had seen an ice man coming to the house and putting ice in the refrigerator. So I ran a little ice route. Mother gave me some ice cubes. We had an electric refrigerator by then and, and it would make ice cubes. I loaded my little truck and I would push it along and put an ice cube off at my imaginary customer, going a little bit further, a little bit further. And by the time I got around, all the ice was melted and I could go back and start all over again. So that was one of my happy memories from early, early childhood. And I bet your mother thought a few ice cubes were a good uh, way to entertain you. <laughs> Mother had very creative, she probably gave me the idea of being an ice man. Uh, yeah, she, she was uh, very good at finding creative ways to take care of a little boy. And do you have siblings? I had, had one older sister who died about two years ago. I have a younger sister and two younger brothers. My youngest brother has died, mm -hmm. but I have still three siblings left, or two siblings left. And did you live in um, Panama City through high school? Most of the time. We spent a small sojourn in Pensacola. Uh, left Panama City when I was in eighth grade and came back for my freshman year in high school. And I say to people that have been on the French Port Conversations, you're part of a small, unique group of Floridian. A native-born Floridian, just a like A native-born Floridian, over 60, over, over 81 years old now. Mm -hmm. Well, gosh, tell us about your college experience. Hmm. I went to Berkshire Christian College. I drove an old 1953 Plymouth from Florida to Lenox, Massachusetts. I had a blowout in North Carolina. I didn't have money to spend for a spare tire, so I just kept going without a spare for a good long while. Got to college and I had, um, I had gone early, got special permission to go early so I could look for a job because I had to have work. And uh, one day before college started, I had uh, been looking for a job, but that was going pretty well. So I took a little time off and went to the college swimming pool. While I was there, a young lady with a little girl came walking down to the pool. And she said, I'm Connie Ainsworth. You must be Jack Jones. And I said, yes. See, her mother had told her that I was in the pool. And Connie knew that her brother Cameron had a friend who was planning to come visit. But she didn't know when he was coming and so she thought I was Cameron's friend who had come to visit. And she told me she was sorry Cameron wasn't home, so she just wanted to be friendly. She kept on being friendly, and she's been doing that for over 57 years now. Congratulations. <laughs> that wasn't, well, maybe that is the best memory about college. But I had a, a lot of, of good memories. I had uh, several different roommates in the dormitories. I did a little what I call preaching at some uh, nearby 
churches there. Um, along the way, I, I continued a, a friendship with Connie and her mother and father. Her father was president of the college. And, and maybe that's the reason I was able to graduate. Uh, he, he didn't want to be embarrassed. Uh, no, I, college was was good, not only for finding someone who was later my spouse, but college was good for the friendships we developed. But more than anything else, I think what Berkshire Christian College did for me was gave me a real foundation for my faith and uh, a real understanding and acceptance of the authority of Scripture. When you went to Berkshire, did you feel a calling to the ministry? Yes, I did. And that was just, that kept developing as you were there. Both Connie and I had had felt a calling to foreign mission service. Uh, She was more receptive to the calling than I was. And I remember one evening on the couch in her living room talking about what might be, we were engaged but not married yet, and talking about going out of the country. And I said, I I really, I want to have children, but I I can't imagine enjoying bringing up my children overseas. Well, that didn't bother her too much. Uh, And after a while, we went to Japan. We had two boys before we left. We had two girls born in Japan. And then after our 10 years there, I realized that that had been the best place in the world to bring up children. The friendships that they formed between themselves and with many others, and many things that they missed from being in America, it was better for them to miss. Um, I know one of your children. Would you tell our viewers and they may know her as well. Most everybody around the village knows Mary Jane. Uh, Mary Jane was our last child to be born, our second girl. And Mary Jane and I, I think, bonded especially because she was the last one and because her sense of humor is similar to mine. There are many times we'll be sitting at the table and someone will say something in conversation, and I will immediately think of a pun that could be made from that. And all I have to do is glance at Mary Jane. She's thought of the same thing. We don't even have to talk about it. Mary Jane is a school teacher, teaches in Corinth Christian Academy, just a little bit north of here, a small Christian school that's uh, maybe about almost 20 years old now. And uh, she's recently become assistant principal there and and teacher. And uh, she really enjoys teaching. She started out when she was about five years old teaching me. (laughs) She was the teacher and I was the pupil and I better behave or I was going to get in trouble. And that still is part of the philosophy she carries to her classroom every day, (laughs) I think. If you can be, if my dad can be good, you can be too, right? Maybe so. (laughs) And you have another relative, by extension, at the village? Mary Jane grew up and went to college, and she came home one day uh, and said to her mother and to me, I've met the man I'm going to marry. He doesn't know it yet. In fact, he has a girlfriend, but that won't last. And so James and Mary Jane were, were married eventually uh, as, as they both finished college. And it's been a, a wonderful blessing to, to have James Sutter for a son-in-law. These days, after since I have retired, I'm home most of the time at noon. And James comes home most of the time at noon to have lunch with me. Mary Jane's too far away. But uh, we are developing not only respect, but a, a real friendship. And another person with a really keen sense of humor, too. Is that right? I think so, from working with James, yes. Well, he do, Mary Jane and I take care of the humor at home, so oh, he okay. says something is Maybe important. he takes his to work. <laughs> yeah. um, tell us a little bit more about when you and Connie met, and then where did you get married? And We were married in the college chapel. Uh, we met, the first time I ever saw her was at the swimming mm-hmm. pool. And 
Well, I'll go back before marriage and tell you a story. We used to come to Florida in the wintertime, um, Christmas time. I had parents in North Florida. She had grandparents in South Florida, so we'd, the whole family would come down and we'd travel together. So on one of those trips, I took her out way out in the country to visit with my grandfather. My maternal grandfather lived there alone most of the time, and I had had wonderful experiences growing up with granddaddy out in the country. So I took her out there, and, and uh, she met him, and we walked around back down by the creek, and he showed us the turtle shells from the turtles he had been butchering and all kind of things like that, which were <laughs> quite new for, for a little Yankee girl. We got ready to go, and we got in the car, and before we drove out of the driveway, granddaddy came out, and he leaned down, put his head in the, in the window, and said, Jackie, you can bring this one back again. So I did. Quite an endorsement, huh? Yes, it was. Then, um, after you finished college, did you leave then for the mission field? Uh, no, we went, into, we went into a pastorate in northern Maine. You can't go any further north without speaking French. It happened to be the church where Connie's father had had his first pastorate, and they had moved away when Connie was just a baby. I was a southern boy going into a main church. We didn't have any candidating time or anything like that. They just wrote a letter and said, would you come be our pastor? And we said yes. So you get into a small town, a small church with great, greatly different traditions, and sometimes you're an outsider. But I brought their baby back, and I was accepted and wonderfully loved, and the most enjoyable experiences in, in church pastoral ministry that we've had was there in Ashland, Maine. And how long were you there? Five and a half years. All the time, and we had told the church earlier that we felt that our, uh, our work should eventually be overseas, and so we continued to work on that and uh, correspond about it and work with the mission board. So. When we resigned from the church, it was to prepare to go overseas. And what was the preparation like to go overseas? The main part of it was a uh, missionary internship, a program in the state of Michigan that puts you through a lot of training and a lot of fellowship and many different experiences. So that lasted seven months. Along the way, Connie had, had gone to graduate school immediately after college, but she hadn't quite finished her degree. And she really wanted that before she left to go into missionary service. So she took off and went back to Wheaton for about three or four months to finish up some coursework. And, and then uh, she finished that about the same time that we both finished missionary internship. And then the summer before we took off to go to Japan, I worked at Disney World on construction. And uh, I haven't really checked up recently, but for, for many years, for decades, the paycheck I received as a union plumber at construction work at Disney was the highest one week paycheck I had received from that time until very <laughs> recently. Uh, so you got a little of the magic from Disney? I did. I, when people talk about going to Disney, I say, well, I went about 50 times one summer years ago. <laughs> uh, if you've been to Disney, you may remember the Contemporary Theme Hotel, mm -hmm. the one that the train runs through the middle of it. Right. That was built, the framework was built, it looked like just a big skeleton with, with holes in the side, because the hotel rooms were built on another site. And they were all constructed, and they picked them up with cranes, and they plugged them in, like putting a uh, drawer in a chest of drawers. So our work was going up and down the hallways, getting the piping ready to receive those rooms. Well, it's, it's it lasted well. Did, was the air conditioning and, and heating still working when you were there? Yes. Okay. <laughs> and you, you got some warm water or some chill water that came through pipes that I put together. Well, thank you for that. <laughs> Jack, um, your first overseas assignment, you said, was Japan, correct? No, oh. actually, we went to New Zealand first. Uh, we were ready to go to Japan, and, and the mission office said, well, we just, we don't have the money this year. Could you do something else for a year? And there's a long story involved in that. 
we said, yes, uh, we'll, we'll find something. We Actually, we came to Florida to visit my folks and looked around and, and talked to a few churches, but nothing seemed to really be right. One church had, um, had invited us to come and do a one-year one year interim pastor. We kept that invitation kind of in the pocket. We didn't know what was going to happen. In the meanwhile, we heard that there was a possibility to go to New Zealand for a one-year intern. But that wasn't definite. The invitation hadn't come. Time was getting later. We were staying in an unheated cabin in southern Vermont. It was a part of Connie's family's property there. And the weather was getting colder. And we didn't know what we were going to do. And it was in September. And I put, pulled an old typewriter out and typed a letter to the church. And in the letter, I said, we, we have prayerfully considered your invitation. And we don't know why, but we just really don't feel that's what we should do. So don't hold that open for us. I walked about a quarter mile down to the mailbox to mail that letter. And when I got there, there was a letter in the mailbox from New Zealand inviting us to come. And I've thought of that many times since. I believe until I was ready to, to let go of the one thing that I knew for sure, because it was not right, mm -hmm. then the invitation that was right was good for us. So we served there for about 10 months in the country and went on to Japan in the summer of, what was it, 1970, I think, 71. During the time that, um, up until then, had you ever been to the village? Yes. Panama City is 185 miles away, and I would come over here for youth camp in Camp Swanee. Some of my camp counselors were Pomeroy Carter, uh, Travis Carter, Theron Mitchell, met name met. But anyhow, we were, I was in Camp Swanee regularly, and when you walk around the old Heritage Trail and see that mm -hmm. tabernacle with the triangle-shaped windows, right. I sat in those windows. Um, and I think there's only one of the cabins like we used to use still standing down in the old, down near the river. Uh, and th those were the boys' cabins. Had wonderful memories from Camp Swanee. Then, years later, uh, I would come over here for a camp meeting or for things like that and for other convention type things. Uh, so when, we'll just get back to when we came to, to Ellen Park the next time. We were serving a pastor in North Carolina and we knew that that was winding up. We didn't know what was gonna be next. I wanted to stay there until Mary Jane's wedding in December and so that would be a final climax to everything. Then we got a call from the village. They were looking for house parents. And we said, well, we, we would like to do that. Uh, that would be good, but we can't come until after the first of the year. So after a while, I was uh, visiting a hospital in, in Raleigh, about 50 miles from home, in a pastoral visit. And Linda French, who was directing the program, called back and told Connie, we have got to have house parents now or we'll have to close the program down. So Connie said, well, I could come on down and take care of things until Jack gets here and he could finish up here at the church. Should have at least a three months notice. So when I came back home, she said, I'm going to Dowling Park. <laughs> <laughs> so she did and she had her hands full with a cottage with some very active children for a while. During that three month period, I came down to visit, I think twice and tried to help out a little bit. And uh, one day I, was a meeting of pastors and they asked what was going on and I said, well, Connie left in July and I found out where she's going and I'm going to go the 1st of October. So uh, then we came back and began our, our work here, working in the cottage with dependent children. Uh, we did that for three years. The village had done child care for almost 100 years, I guess. And it took us three years to, to break it. <laughs> <laughs> No, I they, doubt that's the case. <laughs> the decision was made that we go out of that program and do other children's work. And that gave us one year to find placement for the children and to, uh, to find what we would do. It was decided that I would become a part-time chaplain at the nursing home, and Connie did some other uh, children-related programs for a few years. 
uh, and then when we closed the cottage, I went full time at the nursing home. So that way, I put in 20 years there. I finished and retired 16 days short of my 80th birthday. And when I think of my years of ministry, it was the most fulfilling. Your time at the nursing home. Yes, it was. Well, I can certainly attest to the fact that the person that I was very close to that was there and you were there. Mm -hmm. And um, I know that was very meaningful to families. It was. And Connie is a resident at the nursing home now. And that's, that's always hard for anybody. But it was, it was much easier and much more comfortable for me because I know so many of the staff. Mm -hmm. And I know how they do it. And I know they do it well. And that's a wonderful uh, recommendation for Good Thank Samaritan you. Center. Thank you. Um, we could do about four chapters of this, but Jack, um, tell us about your other children as well, if you would. Our oldest son was born in 1966, Jeremy. He lives in Fort Worth, Texas now, very active in the church there. In fact, he came to visit me last week and left at, uh, well, he left the night before and flew out of Jacksonville at seven o'clock to preach in Fort Worth for the morning service on Easter Sunday. <laughs> That, that's old Jeremy. Um, he teaches special education, severely, mentally, and or physically handicapped children. And uh, it, it's, it's been a wonderful work for him. He's, he's almost retirement age, but he doesn't know how much longer he'll be doing that. Our second son, Barney, Daniel, he, his name is Daniel Barney Jones. He's named for that granddaddy who said I could bring Connie back again. He was Barney. But after he grew up, got through college, uh, he kind of dropped Barney and he's Daniel now. He retired from the Army as a lieutenant colonel about three years ago. And his, his work in the Army was military intelligence and training military intelligence officers. After he retired, he went to work immediately for a contractor who trains military intelligence officers. So he's, he's still doing that. They have seven children. Six were born to them, and they adopted one. They had five girls before the first two little boys came along. And so those little boys have a lot of advice in their house from their sisters <laughs> and care and direction. But uh, things are going very well for them. Our first daughter, Amy, was born in Japan in 1973. She was the first baby born in the Seventh-day Adventist Hospital in Kobe, Japan. We didn't have a car at the time. The mission had cars and sometimes we'd have one appointed to us and sometimes not. So I had to go to language school in the morning. We were, hadn't, had not been there very long. And I was still in language school. So Connie got up. Uh, and walked down to the train station, got on a train, took about four train stops, got off, got on a bus, and went on an old bus up over the mountain to get up to the, where the hospital was. The bus stopped at a little wide spot in the road, and the community was down the hill there, and nobody uh, knew where the hospital was. A taxi driver was there, so she got on the taxi, and. She had been there once to visit the hospital during construction, and so she could remember a little bit, and, and she could speak Japanese a little bit, so she got him to the hospital. <laughs> she was not in labor, by the way. Oh, good. <laughs> I was wondering how that story not was going to turn. But this was prearranged because the, the time had come in, in our transportation situation, so the doctor said, come on over. So she got into the hospital, and uh, while they were still setting up the room and everything, they, they induced labor, and they were still putting bl uh, blinds on the windows and, and being sure they had all the equipment and everything. And the baby was born late that night. I went to language school, brought one of the language school's fellow students of mine from uh, Norway, by the way, came home to sit with the boys uh, while I went over to the hospital. So I got over there. I, I borrowed a car by then and got over to the hospital. And, uh, 
and Amy was born, and, and everything was fine. So that was Amy's birth. What were we going to say about Amy? Oh, yeah. Well, she grew up. She came back home. She uh, excelled in school all the way through. She excelled and still excels in being able to go into a room where there's a crowd of people or just a few people and pick out the one person in the room who needs somebody to sit and talk with them. And, and she, she makes many good friends that way. She, uh, after high school, went to nurses training, uh, married a fellow from, from Maine, and uh, they moved. He was working with the highway department as an engineer, and they moved from uh, Georgia to West Virginia to Pennsylvania, and then they got far enough north in Vermont. And they live, have lived in Vermont now for uh, 15 years, I think it is. They have two children, one boy in college and one girl in, in high school. Amy has continued nursing. Recently, about two years ago, she got a job as infection preventionist in a hospital way up in northern Vermont. A few months after she got that job, the coronavirus hit. And she was still learning about infection prevention, mm -hmm. but she has learned a lot in this past year. That's a speed course that's happened, hasn't it, by necessity. Jack, thank you so much for coming and sitting down with us and, and chatting today. But I hope we can do this again because there's lots more stories to hear from Jack Yeah, I Jones. still have another daughter. Oh, my goodness. Let me put that one in. Then maybe you can take some other stuff yeah. out, okay? That's fine. In 1975, Connie was expecting our last child. We didn't want to be the last child, but that's what it was. She was expecting Mary Jane. And we had, uh, had been up to the mountains for the summer. We got home in August. It was terribly hot. Went to see the doctor. The doctor said, well, you probably have another week or so. This was in 1975. Gasoline was short in Japan. One day I was helping another missionary family move. And we had a, a station wagon. They had a station wagon. We drove different cars as we moved things back and forth. About 7 o'clock, Connie said, I think I need to go to the hospital. The hospital was 70 miles away. And the gas stations had closed at 6.30. I said, we can't go tonight. We don't have enough gas in the car to get there. And she said, OK. About a half hour later, she said, I think I need, <laughs> I need to go to the hospital anyhow. Well, I remembered I had been driving my friend's car, and I knew that his tank was full, and his car was air conditioned. So I went over to his house, the new house he just moved into. The weather was hot, the window was open. I went to his bedroom window and I said, Jackie? He said, yes. I said, Connie needs to go to the hospital and I don't have enough gas in my car. He didn't say anything, he just reached the keys out the window to me. <laughs> and we rode to the hospital 70 miles in air-conditioned comfort and Mary Jane was born later that night. And she's made life interesting ever since. And I, I'm glad to know her myself. Thank you so much for Thank this you. time. Thank you. I hope you'll tune in soon to another Front Porch Conversation.